I'm now going to introduce our keynote lecturer. Professor Roger Ebbetson is visiting professor at Lancaster University and a vice president of both the Hardy and Tennyson Societies. He is also a fellow of the English Association and has previously taught at the University of Sokoto in Nigeria, the University of Worcester, and Loughborough University. Recent publications include Hardy, The Margin of the Unexpressed, which was, to me, personally, invaluable during my PhD studies, An Imaginary England, Landscape and Literature, and Landscapes of Eternal Return. He is currently working on a new theoretical study of Hardy's poetry and fiction, and it is my pleasure to welcome Professor Roger Ebbetson. Thanks very much, Tracy. I think we all owe a great debt to Tracy, if I can just say that in organising this uh, re, you know, reduplicated study day uh, under what remain pretty difficult circumstances. So thanks very much, Tracy, for all the work that you're, you're doing. Uh, well, morning, everyone. And, and I think everyone has a copy of my uh, of the handout, which I'm, I'll with this lovely lady on the front, um, which I will be, uh, which I'll, has everybody got, got a copy of that? Yeah. You might be tested on it later, so that's, uh, I'm only going to, um, my paper just focuses on that, the, the one scene uh, during the honeymoon, uh, which we'll come to in, um, um, in a few minutes when Tess glimpses the um, female portraits. <coughs> Hardy's own interest in the idea of a family tree, of course, uh, as I'm sure we all know, developed quite obsessively uh, in his later years. Um, um, Clive Harfield has written in the journal that nobility decayed is a leitmotif or a theme that Hardy... Uh, uses in Tess of the D'Urbervilles, but was also fascinating for Hardy himself. Uh, Harfield says, although of himself, of, uh, uh, although of artisan origins, his father being a small holding builder and his mother a, a former maidservant, for much of his life, Hardy believed himself descended from medieval Hardys, who were once prominent landowners in this area. So that's an important idea, isn't it, for for Hardy, I think, and for for, for his work. As we know, he owned a number of books on genealogies and family history, including John Hutchins' uh, Hutchins History of Dorset, which in Hardy's copy is replete with his own annotations, bearing witness to the idea that the Hardys were a family in decline. Hardy also um, consulted a local antiquary, the Reverend Charles Bingham, who becomes the Reverend uh, Tringham in the opening crucial section of the novel. Transmuting the the name D'Urberville to Derbyfield signals for us as readers the fall of this once notable family a descent underlined by Hardy's evocation of the D'Urbervilles, of course, or their family vault in Kingsbeer Church, based, based on the Turberville Chapel at Beer Regis. Other local families um, <coughs> in the novel are also subject to this fall, and the first quotation is uh, Dairyman Crick telling the dairymaids there is the billets and the drinkards and the greys and the St. Quintins and the Hardys and the Goulds who used to own the la- uh, number one who used to own the land for miles down this valley. You could buy them all up now for an old song almost. Why little Retty Priddle here, you know, is one of the Paridells. Um, my colleague at Lancaster, Camilla Elliott, has written a very good book on um, family portraits in Gothic fiction. Uh, She notes how in one of the novels of the 1790s, the heroine says, I have experienced the transmigration of souls uh, uh, fled from the body of a fine lady to that of a country girl. So there's a very long 
um, theme in English literature, this is the date of that novel is 1793, so it's 100 years before Tess itself. There's a lot of work, as uh, Camilla shows in her book, on uh, family portraits in Gothic fiction. This sort of transmigration links the downward mobility of portraiture to the idea of the realist novel in the 19th century representing humbler, as it were, realities. So the Victorian middle class becomes haunted, as Hardy himself, I think, does, by almost images of downward mobility of the family tree. Uh, Hardy's investment in a romantic version of his essentially, in quotes, low-born family would culminate, as many of us know, in 1917 in his construction of the handwritten Hardy pedigree, which claimed a link to a Jersey family the, uh, in the Middle Ages, the Le Hardys. Indeed, uh, Bill Gates tells us that as an old, older man, Hardy's <clears throat> complained that there were still people here in Dorchester who were too grand to speak to him, uh, leading Hardy, Hardy to explain, ours was also a county family, if only they knew. <laughs> so he lacked that recognition. At the beginning of the composition of the novel, um, heredity was of little significance, apparently, in the Ur text, but the, grad, the successive printed versions of the novel, beginning with the serial, increase that uh, obsession or that theme of the family history. <clears throat> At the beginning of the book, we, we may remember, Tess regards the identity of her family with the knightly d'Urbervilles as, quote, unpleasant, uh, as she feels when she first encounters Alec, with his touches of barbarism and the bold and his bold rolling eye. Uh, next quotation, number two. She had dreamed of an aged and dignified face, the sublimation of all the d'Urberville lineaments, furrowed with incarnate memories, rather than this uh, bold, uh, overbearing uh, man that she meets or face that she meets. However, on meeting Angel who she sees as a gentleman and student of history, she then hopes, so she sort of tries to deny her uh, putative ancestry with, um, uh, with Alec, but with Angel, she hopes that he will acknowledge that she was no spurious d'Urberville uh, like those at Trantridge, but a true d'Urberville to the bone. So she changes her tune, as it were, when she meets Angel. Towards the end of the novel, a repentant angel regrets his earlier favour to acknowledge Tess's d'Urberville descent, uh, quotation three. It was a fact that would soon be forgotten, that bit of distinction in poor Tess's blood and name. And oblivion would fall upon her hereditary link with the marble monuments and leaded skeletons. So does time ruthlessly destroy his own Romances. It's towards the end, end of the novel, of course. <clears throat> Portraits in Victorian literature are very wide uh, spread. And um, quotation four, quote, uh, critic Lynette Felber says, the literary portrait provides a verbal representation of physical appearance that establishes character. Literary portraits work vicariously, asking readers to conceptualize conceptualize imaginatively what the characters see, see it in their mind's eye. So it's a translation or a movement from what the character sees to then hopefully what, what we see, as it were. In terms of Hardy's own work, Tess's experience, um, which we're coming, I'm coming to in a minute, is anticipated in Pair of Blue Eyes when Elfried and Stephen pay a visit to the Luxellian mansion, Endelstow House. On entering the gallery, the heroine, um, Elfried, whose clerical father is a keen genealogist, she begins to feel somewhat depressed by the society of the Luxellian shades, I'm just quoting here, of cadaverous complexion. So she looks and sees these almost skeletal, rather haunting figures. She begins to feel um, depressed by them, which seem to gaze at and through her. Eight years later, in uh, Laodicean, 
hardly further elaborates this in Paula Power's fixation with the Distancy family portraits in the castle. When Somerset, her um, um, uh, would-be fiancé, first views these portraits, he is aware that, quote, it required a profounder mind than his to disinter the lineaments that really sat in the painter's presence. Some portraits had, he thinks, nobility stamped upon them, um, but these distances are identified by a special indent on, in their noses. So, uh, they're not quite so, so beautiful or glamorous. Later, when Paula herself looks at the paintings with Captain Distancy, who's making a play for her hand, she feels as if the Distancies had stretched out a tentacle from their genealogical, uh, genealogical tree to seize her by the hand and draw her in to their mass. So the family concerns of Hardy himself, of Elfried and of Paula, feed into and motivate this episode, which I'll come to now, of Tess's very ominous encounter with the d'Urberville portraits at the beginning of her ill-fated honeymoon, a scene which first appears in the graphic serialization. <clears throat> the state of Wellbridge Manor anticipates this encounter, you probably remember. The building itself was a fine manorial residence, the property and seat of a d'Urberville, now reduced to what, uh, by what Clare calls its mutilations, into a simple farmhouse. When they come in, Angel says satirically, welcome to one of your ancestral mansions. But it's significant at that moment that, quote, the mouldy old habitation depressed his bride. A depression which then deepens dramatically, and this is um, um, quotation, the rather longer quotation, this is the key scene, uh, number five. What's the matter, said he. Those horrid women, she answered, how they frightened me. He looks up and perceives two life-size portraits. I won't read it all, but the long pointed features, narrow eye and smirk of the one, suggestive of merciless treachery. The bill hook nose, large teeth and bold eye of the, uh, of the other, suggesting arrogance to the point of ferocity. Haunt the beholder. Whose portraits are those, Claire says to the um, uh, woman who's in charge. I've been told by old folk they were the ladies of the d'Urberville family, the ancient lords of this manor. Claire himself acknowledges, quote, Tess's fine features were traceable in these exaggerated forms. And... Um, Quotation six, Jan Gordon, the critic, says, as if to accentuate the failure of the couple to begin by casting off history, Tess becomes a historian by insisting upon confessing her past be beneath the imaginary portraits of her ancestors. So the crucial confessional scene takes place under the gaze of these uh, Haridans. Despite the lover's subsequent erotic mingling of fingers in the water basin, Claire remarks, Tess, you are, uh, number seven, Tess, you are not a bit cheerful this evening, not at all as you used to be. Those Harridans on the panels have unsettled you. I'm sorry I brought you here. Then, on returning late at night from a stroll in the gardens, uh, uh, quotation eight, Claire catches sight of one of the d'Urberville dames whose portrait was over the entrance to Tess's bedchamber. In the candlelight, the painting was more than unpleasant. Sinister design lurked in the woman's features, a purpose of revenge on the other sex. The Caroline bodice of the portrait was low, precisely as Tess's had been when he tucked it in to show the necklace. And again, he experiences the distressing sensation of resemblance between them. Tess's consternation in front of the portraits, whereby she becomes other to herself, 
resonates in a late Hardy poem, The Pedigree, in which the speaker sits through the night, quote, scanning my sire sown tree, scanning, scanning my family tree, whose branches, quote, seem to twist into a seared and cynic face. Quotation nine. Said I then, sunk in tone, I am merest mimic, mimicker and counterfeit, though thinking I am I, and what I do, I do myself alone. The cynic twist of the page thereat unknit back to its normal figure, having wrought its purport wry. The mage's mirror left the window square, and the stained moon and drift retook their places there. So the speaker is depressed by the feeling that he is not an individual in himself, is he? He is the result of his four fathers and mothers. The, the, the ancestry determines his character and deprives him of independent uh, life. Another poem, um, Heredity, number 10. I am the family face, flesh perishes, I live on, projecting trait and trace through time to times and on, leaping from place to place over oblivion. And in another text, which I've not got on the paper, she and they, uh, she, I and they, a husband and wife sit with the portraits of their family hanging around them and hearing a ghostly sigh, they attribute it to the fact that the portraits repine, they suffer, that we are the last of our stock once unsurpassed, you know, that we are the last of a, of a long line. Thus it is that Tess at Wellbridge Manor, despite earlier in her courtship voicing resistance to being, quote, one of a long row only, now begins to see herself as what, uh, quotation 11, sine pro, another poem says, uh, quack, uh, defines as the last one, outcome of each spectral past, one of that file, so many man. So again, the same implication, I am the last of this long line come to dissuade. As a novel of the 1890s, uh, we might wish uh, to contextualise Tess of the D'Urbervilles in relation to the decadent movement, and nowhere more so than in this crucial scene of the portraits. The most sensational fictional depiction of ancestral portraiture uh, uh, in the decadent period was, of course, the picture of Dorian Gray, published in the same year as Hardy's text, 1892. And in Oscar Wilde's novel, as uh, I'm sure you all know, the theme is focused not only on the ageing and degra degradation of the portrait, whilst Dorian himself remains incredibly youthful and... Uh, and handsome, but also in a scene where Dorian himself inspects the picture gallery in his country house and speculates when he looks at them, have, has he inherited some strange poisonous germ which has crept from body to body, body till it reaches his own? Were his own actions merely the dreams that a dead man, the dead man had not dared to realise he thinks and looking at another ancestor he thinks how evil he looks the face saturnine the lips twisted with disdain and in the last scene of the novel uh, number 12 on the sheet when he looks again at his own portrait which has disintegrated into this appallingly ugly one a cry of indignation broke from him he could see no change, say that in the eyes there was a look of cunning, the mouth crink the, the curved wrinkle of the hypocrite. The thing was loathsome, more loathsome than before. And these kind of scenes recur in other <coughs> novels of the 90s by Zola, Isma and others, but they do signal the way in which in Lombroso's current, I mean current then, theory of phrenology, the face reveals your atavistic nature. Lombroso reads the face 
as signalling what lies in the past, uh, not your own past, but ancestral past also. As in Hardy's text, of course, Dorian's redemption is only achieved through the death of the protagonist. Prior to this, it's also pertinent to note how, during the course of the narrative, Tess herself becomes painterly. She becomes an object to, as it were, be painted through the dominant male gaze shared by Alec and Angel. Tess frequently features as a, as a, a, a surface on, on which a pattern is imposed. She can be likened to a canvas upon which her mother paints an image of sort of womanhood, desirable womanhood, in order to ensnare Alec. Mrs. Durbeyfield's plan, uh, Durbeyfield's plan, of course, leads to the rape stroke seduction scene, number 13, where Hardy uh, concludes why it was that upon this beautiful feminine tissue, sensitive as gossamer, and blank as snow as yet, there should have been traced such a coarse pattern as it was doomed to receive. So that's traceable, of course, to the past. The night in the chase, coupled with Tess's later disturbing encounter with the sign painter, with his staring vermilion words of damnation, signal the heroine's transition from unspoilt village maiden to what we might call a portrait on an easel. She becomes a patterned tissue etched in the red letters of destruction. You remember the sign painter's message, thy damnation slumbereth not. Deleuze and Guattari, in discussing uh, the protagonists of Hardy's novels and of Lawrence's, say um, the characters know how difficult it is to get out of one's subjectivity, how tempting to get caught, to be linked, to become but a face, to become only a face. The novel form, then, they argue, is defined by lost characters who no longer know their name, what they are looking for or what they are doing. As Tess gazes in bewilderment at the family portraits, her view of them uh, illustrates the argument in Deleuze that the face is not animal or human. There is something inhuman about the face. We seek, Deleuze says, to escape from the face. The face is present, as it were, in its refusal to be contained. It resonates beyond its own uh, image. Uh, well, I'll skip a bit, but <clears throat> Jan Gordon points out how in the penultimate meeting at the Herons, when uh, uh, Angel comes back, Tess will not allow Angel to come too close. Her looks, uh, um, Jan Gordon argues, having become similar to that of her pictured ancestors, of an aestheticised object out of life. She's become a painting. <laughs> She's lost her own uh, personality somehow. This crucial rencounter, then, in the last stages of the novel, bears out um, uh, Camilla Elliott's idea that resemblance to family portraits attests to kinship and identifies peasants as heirs. That's Camilla Elliott about you know um, Gothic fiction, but. It now identifies peasants as the heirs to this so-called nobility. So the novel does signal that, that uh, uh, transmutation of, 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 uh, uh, from the souls of the deceased. Tess's experience enacts what we might call a taking away of the face a defacing or a disfiguration. Um, and uh, Linda Nochlin writes, Insof insofar as she was poor, passive, 
and natural, understood to be content with her role as mother, this is after when she's had the baby, this served as an ideal vehicle, not only for femininity, but for those of the good worker, but this, of course, becomes um, uh, strained in, in, in Tess. This paternalist ideal is reversed in the death of infant sorrow, but by the same token, the d'Urberville noble women, in their treachery and arrogance, challenge the accepted norms of female beauty and virtue. The melancholic gaze which they cast towards Tess preordains her doom-laden future. The d'Urbervilles now are in a state of homeless decline, and this scene serves to frame the political implications of the novel as a whole, leading to the final nomadic phase of Tess's career, where, as Angel Clare reflects, her body begins to drift like a corpse upon the current in a direction dissociated from its living will. Um, I'll skip a bit. Early in the novel, Hardy tresses how Tess, at this point, was a mere vessel of emotion, and he notes how the dialect was on her tongue to some extent, despite the village schooling. So she spoke the two languages, dialect at home, ordinary English abroad. Her uprooted condition, which the two languages signal, subsequent to Wellbridge Manor, thus fulfills the idea of becoming a nomad or a gypsy. She becomes a nomad. What appears, um, Adorno suggests, what appears ugly is that we take in the absorption of the ugly. The aesthetics of ugliness in art gives us an insight into this scene. Uh, Adorno writes that a face deformed by painting is plain ugly. What appears ugly is in the first place historically older, what art has rejected. The grimness to which Tess is subjected by the portraits acts as a kind of imitation of fear, an emotion transferred to Hardy's heroine. Thus it is that Tess's beauty, uh, okay. thus it is that Tess's beauty, uh, where she is a fine, handsome girl of the opening scene at Marlott, with her mobile peony mouth and large, innocent eyes, in this later scenes, becomes compromised in a kind of dialectic with ugliness. The beauty of art becomes a kind of uh, violence. It's striking how, following her exposure to the faces of the ancestors, in the downward trajectory of the novel, her identity is neutralised and she becomes effaced. So, on her forlorn journey to Flintcombe Ash, to try to disguise her features, she takes a handkerchief and ties it round her face, becoming, quote, a figure which is part of the landscape. And Marion says, why is it your crumbly face tied up in such a way? There's a suggestion by the critic uh, uh, Edward Casey, interesting book on, on edges. The edges of veils, he says, show just enough to suggest what lies under the veil. In other words, the veil is more revealing than not wearing the veil or the mask. Quote, um, and you've not got this. A veil allows us to see what is veiled in its edges. What is veiled is a captive of its own edges, even if it is concealed. Despite the veil, we are privy to the veiled thing itself. By contrast, later, returning from her... So she veils herself, <coughs> hiding her face. Coming back from her useless visit to Angel's parents, Tess then decides, quote, to throw up her veil, uh, quotation 15, and, and says this of her face. It is nothing. It is nothing. Nobody loves it. Nobody sees it. Who cares about the looks of a castaway like me? And at the end of the novel, as the two young women labour at the Starveacre place of Flintcombe Ash, the landscape itself 
begins to reflect this self-effacement. The Swede field takes on, quote, a complexion without features, as if a face from chin to brow should be only an expanse of skin, just to, without any features, featureless. A phenomenon counterbalanced by the sky which displays the same white vacuity of countenance, quotation 16. So these two upper and nether visages confronted each other, all day long the white face looking down on the brown face, and the brown face looking up at the white face, without anything standing between them but the two girls. Uh, crawling over the surface of the former like flies. And at the end, as uh, the penultimate chapter, as we all remember, Tess's journey through life cult culminates tragically at Stonehenge, where, as she lies on the sacrificial stone uh, tomb, she herself reflects with nothing but the sky above my face. Thanks very much. Well, thank you very much, Roger. That was amazing. I hadn't, I hadn't personally linked Lombroso and phrenology to Tess. I. And it totally makes sense. Why didn't I? Thank you so much for pointing out so many amazing things about the novel. And I'm sure I'm not the only one, I hope, that hadn't made some of these links. That was a, a wonderful, wonderful talk. Thank you, Roger, indeed.